we went into Quito. If you visit Ecuador, this is the place where most of you embark. It's high in the Andes Mountains. And when you're in Quito, you need to go, of course, to some of the tourist things, like the center of the earth, where you can put one foot in the northern hemisphere and one foot in the southern hemisphere and learn about shrunken heads and the candira fish, the parasitic catfish. Presumably, it's attracted to human urine. And if you urinate while in the water, it will swim up your urethra and lodge there. Fact or fiction? Of course, it is fiction, but it makes for a nice story. So again, tourist stuff. If you are in Ecuador, you are surrounded by volcanoes along the Andes spine. There's seven around Quito. From our hotel window, we saw the Cotopaxi volcano. And as we flew to Coco in the, uh, the town in the rainforest, we actually saw one of the active uh, volcanoes, seeing the dark sm smoke from the volcanoes. But getting to the good stuff here with the biodiversity and the different ecosystems, you can see on the photograph on the right, the spine of Ecuador with the Andes Mountains, the dry and coastal plains, the mangroves, uh, of course, the Galapagos way out, which Bill's gonna be talking about later. We have the cloud forests, and then all of this big green over here is the lowland uh, rainforests. And right there is Coca. That's where we're going to fly from Quito here to Coca and then take a two hour boat ride down the El Napo River. Uh, talking about biodiversity, this is one of the countries that is the mega diversity country. For instance, the native plants, if you look at the blue box on the lower right, the native vascular plants. There are 17,683 species of vascular plants in Ecuador compared to about 500 less in the United States. But you have to realize, I know Ecuador is in the tropics, but it's about the size of Nevada. And one of the uh, uh, brag about types of fam family of uh, plants that's found in Ecuador is the orchids. And there are over 4,000 different species of orchids and the endemic species. Endemics are, they're found here and nowhere else in the world. The orchids make over half the endemics of that country. Now, the biodiversity of animals in Ecuador is a little bit harder to ascertain. If you want to ask me a question about that, we can talk about it later. But over at the botanical gardens in Quito, just beautiful, beautiful orchids there in a couple of their houses, and they are just spectacular. You can see the different colors. And one of my favorite uh, is an orchid with three names. It's the monkey orchid, the monkey face orchid, or the Dracula orchid. And you can see by the scientific name, Dracula simia. Dracula, of course, refers to the Transylvanian count. Uh, and simia, of course, refers to simians, which is the monkeys, the mammal monkeys. Uh, the photos on my left are not mine. These are mine. Everything else for one other photo is mine. But uh, if you look at the, the resemblance, it is striking. And the Dracula part comes from these sepals that come off the orchids. So uh, the other house that's really remarkable is the one on pitcher plants. And these are climbers or vine pitcher plants. And what's unique about them is they have this big opening where uh, insects come in. They come to the nectar around the rim, they fall in, the sides are slick, and they become a meal for the plant, usually in uh, uh, poor soils. So the nitrogen of the bodies of the dead animals help the surviving survivor of the surviving of the of the uh, pincher plants. All right, here we go. We're in the plain. We're going to Coca on the Napo River. And you can see in the foreground, there is the town. But if you look on the other side of the river, the El Napo River, this is all the lowland tropical rainforest, better known as the jungle. Uh, in the town, we could stop by the drugstore. So you don't have packaged goods like we do, of course, in the more civilized parts of the country. Uh, here you have uh, different remedies and, and curative things. Uh, liquid farm, leaf farm, or tuber root farm. So 
quite unique. And this is what's also nice about the diversity of, of the uh, rainforest is they give us a heck of a lot of medicines and they may give us a lot of cures in the future, like for cancer and things. But the eth ethnobotany, the, the, the relationship here is disappearing with different generations leaving the rainforest. But we did get a little bit of sampling this. We spent a half day with a family who showed us how to live in the uh, rural areas where, of course, you don't have any of the creature comforts and you have to eat things off the land, like the heart of palm and the wild cacao. And uh, it's not the kind they use for chocolate. They basically were using it for medicine, especially snake bites. And of course, the river is a lifeblood for the people along the uh, rainforest. A lot of the people fish. You can see a lot of the huts of the indigenous peoples along the edge of the river. And of course, we use the same mode of transportation, these long skinny speedboats that can zigzag through the, uh, the bars here because there's shallow parts and uh, deeper parts. And of course, we did pass development. This is what's coming into a lot of the, the rainforest is the petroleum companies. And there's no roads back there, so they have to depend upon the barge to transport their big oil rigs. So it's quite unusual coming down the river and all of a sudden these four tanker trucks pass you. When we got to the cultural center, uh, it was open air, the cafeteria, the, the rallying point. Uh, here we'd find out what's happening and people say, my God, it must have been roughing it in the rainforest. Well, this is our hut. The saw skippers were on one side, we were on the other, and you can see the, the sleeping uh, arrangements were quite comfortable even with the uh, mosquito netting. We took adventures out uh, by boat every day or we hiked. And on the boat adventures, we could see again, a good firsthand look at the emergent vegetation and uh, the different layers uh, in the rainforest. We were clomping through, of course, we'd have to be on paths or uh, just sort of beating our way through. So it's much more open uh, along the river's edge. The cloudiness actually comes from the volcanic ash from the Andes. The Andes, uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the volcanic ash is washed off the hillsides. As uh, in contrast to, we were fortunate enough to take a half day up some of the tributaries of the El Napo. And this is where the, the uh, river turns that clear tannin color. And this is where a lot of the endemics live and the magic, including things like piranhas. They put a little piece of bait in a hook and caught a piranha for us. So the piranhas live in the clear tributaries and not in the main rivers. And of course, cruising along the main rivers, though, it gave us a good access point to see monkeys, like the squirrel monkeys. Uh, these troops are uh, very hard to miss because they're sometimes in the hundreds. The biggest monkey in the area is the red howler monkey. And as you can see here in the red box, 60% of its herbivorous diet comes from leaves. And they are usually way high because they like the tender leaves that grow up high in the canopy. Around the river's edge, you can see small birds like the white winged swallows or the little nightjar, or what's one of the most unusual birds. It's called the Watson or the stink bird. And as you can see here, it's the only bird in the world to eat only leaves. And it does this because it has many stomachs, just like cows and bison. And as they digest all this mixture, they belch and it is stinky. That's the name stink bird or stinky bird. One of the most unique areas we saw from the river is this humongous, this real big clay lick. And to give you an idea how important these things are, you can read here 75% of the vegetation in the rainforest is toxic, all these leaves and things. And these birds come and they ingest clay. There is a, an ingredient in the clay called kaolin, uh, which neutralizes these ingested toxins. Also, these clay licks are good sources of salts and minerals and even a place to do a little dating and mating. So, but you don't want to be the first animal out on the clay lick. You don't want, you want the whole group to go out there 
unless you get a volunteer that is, doesn't mind getting a little risk because predators also key into this and they get the first guy that comes to the lick. So what happens is a lot of the birds uh, accumulate and gather on the sides and this is like, where is Waldo? This all green here has about 30 parrots in it. You can see some on the bare branches, but it's amazing how these birds blend in and then all of a sudden they come to the clay lick and they stick out. And you can see the, the yellow crown, the mealies, the blue parrots and parakeets and just a fabulous place to see. Well, we were pretty lucky most of the days with rain. It is a rainforest, but on some days we got caught, in, but not too often, in the rain. And it turns the, the trail, as you can see on the bottom left there, it's it mucky. And that's why we all got issued rubber boots. Rubber boots were our friends. And it just so happens we were going to a more intimate a clay lick, but it was raining so hard, no, nothing was coming. But we did happen to see crested owls in the in the uh, cloudburst here and uh, my camera didn't work real well after that for about a day. Our guides were fabulous. They told us what was safe, what was benign and like the leaf cutter ants that collect the leaves to grow fungus on in their nests to feed the, the whole group, the whole colony. And then the things that we should watch out for, the conga ant or the bullet ant. Very painful neurotoxic sting. Uh, presumably the pain lasts for like whole day. It doesn't go away like wasp and bee stings. It's one of the top one or two things as far as pain by animals from a sting or a bite in the world. So uh, these conga ants were something else. But there was a, such a diversity of things that were active during the day and then at night. Uh, just a, just a, you didn't know what to take a picture of first. And the butterflies. Uh, in, in Ecuador, there are about 4,500 different species of butterflies. Very difficult to identify these. So if they weren't real conspicuous, uh, it was hard because there were a lot of white guys, a lot of orange guys, and you get my point. I mean, all these different butterflies were just unbelievable. We did happen, if you're into butterflies, to see a leg lane, egg lane. That's easy for you to say, blah, blah, blah. We saw the ruby spotted swallowtail. You can see it landed here on this plant and it's curling its abdomen around to lay the egg on the underneath side of the leaf. So really cool. We were also blessed with russet backed oropendulas. We mentioned the red howlers the other day or a little bit farther in the, the program, but the russet backed oropendulas would be greeting us every morning. Very noisy bird along with the red howlers. The oropendulas are cool because they make these pendulous nests just like the orioles around here. Some of the neatest bird hikes or hikes we had in the forest were basically to the tower uh, to get up above the canopy, 44 meters high. So you had to go up. Uh, it took a while to get up there. This is about three fourths of the way up and you could see the bromeliads right there firsthand. And again, the, the bromeliads, the, the beautiful flowers, and then when you get to the top, you can look straight down and there are all the canopy trees, the tops of the canopy trees. And if you look out again, late in the evening or early in the morning, it's that mist and it's just fabulous. You know, it's such, such a place and you can hear all the, the sounds, the night sounds, the beginning or the early morning sounds. And then finally, when the sun uh, baked the, the fog, you could see things a little better. There was a little turquoise speck right here. This is this other picture that is not mine. Uh, it's amazing these guys can pick out these little colored patches uh, and then get the spotting scope on it. But we saw a spangled cotingo. This is not my photo. I got this off Wikipedia. It's taken to the Cincinnati Zoo. But it was a spectacular bird and we did get the spotting scope on it and, and saw it. So uh, the small birds far away were hard. We did see some bigger birds, or the ones that landed very close to us, like the Pied Puffbird or the Air Carry and, and the Trogans. Uh, this was the gartered one, but it was, it was so neat seeing these birds. When we were hiking, the guides would say, oh, monkey, 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 
and we'd all be looking up and we all saw green. So most of the monkeys in our hikes, our on the ground hikes, it was a fleeting glimpse. There's only one time we really got a good view of this particular species, just a beautiful monkey, a white-tailed TD monkey. And it's a fruit eater and, and uh, uh, just a beautiful animal to watch. And they were very curious, but they didn't stay long. These animals are used to being hunted, so they, they don't wanna, it's not like the Galapagos that Bill will talk about later. These guys run. Then before we, we uh, moved on to the Galapagos, we did take a day out and go birding around Mindo, which are the cloud forests. These are the, we were in the lowland rainforest, now we're in the upland cloud forest, the rainforest up high. And the flowers, again, seeing orchids in an orchid house in the botanical garden is one thing, but seeing them out is really special. And the color of some of the flowers there were just spectacular. It was really neat seeing the different colors. And the primary forest, or the, again, the, the rainforest that was, was not disturbed at all, and we might call it virgin, but uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty neat too with the thick vegetation. We saw more trogons. You can see my, my mug there, but then the bronze winged parrots and things. So just a real special place. But what a lot of people go to Ming Mindo for is to see the Kaka Rock. And this was a lek area. And this one fellow had a lek on his property and he decided to take, turn it into a tourist attraction. Now there's better photos on, the, on the, the internet, but here we got some pictures through the spotting scopes. But the males come here sort of like the, the booming grounds of cherry prairie chickens and they do their thing, they display and the females can come in and see if they're interested or not. And uh, one of the neat things, if you look in the bottom right, there's an Aunt Pitta whisperer by the name of Angel Paz and he actually calls and talks to these guys and gives them a little bit of food. Uh, Aunt Pittas are, are, are adapted for the dark forest floor. They have real dark upper plumage and large eyes, again, to see because there's a limited amount of light. Long legs, look at the legs on these guys. And we saw four species in one day. And these are normally, just seeing one of these every once in a while is a bird lover's delight. So seeing four of them, two about 2,000 meters and two of them about 1,700 meters. We had to go to different places. And then we went over uh, to the gravy areas, gravy train areas. These are the areas, of course, that put out some attractants. Uh, we went to two of these, these areas just to uh, go ahead and see what some of these things are out in the wild and sort of gathering. This Alambi Al uh, was a hummingbird paradise. They had just oodles and oodles of hummingbird feeders out. So you get up close and personal with these hummingbirds. It was just amazing. To give you an idea of the diversity, you ready for this? Look at all the different hummingbirds at this one place. It was like, you know, a dozen and a half hummingbirds. And it was like jerking your head back and forth because there's one over, oh, look at that one over there. You know, so it was constant. And we also lucked in and saw two of the very distinguishable uh, hummingbirds with real long tails. This one's called the booted racket tail. And you can see these white fuzzy cottony boots on its, on its feet. And then one of the most beautiful birds are the silts. This was a violet-tailed silt. The last place we went to was the Tanninger Station in the town of San Tadeo. And again, they have a nice covered uh, blind area and the woman was nice enough to put out some fresh plantain and other things and brought in the Tanningers and they were spectacular. Two of the best, they're just the blue and the yellow and the black, the black chin mountain tanager and the blue wing mountain tanager, very similar, but just striking birds along with the blue tanager. And we were fortunate enough to see the red rump toucanet also. And that's about it. That's my 20 minutes and I'm finishing a couple of seconds early. Well, we have, we have some time, Bill, you think, to take a question or two, if there are any. Dave, did you see any snakes when you were there? 
No, unfortunately not. We, we basically were looking for a lot of these other creepy crawlers. The things that they talk about is watch out for this, watch out for that. Again, the biodiversity is so high, the chances of seeing anything like a jaguar or a snake or, you know, something like that are, are limited. And we did a lot of our travels on the rivers and did some hiking, but uh, they say you got a better chance out at night, but I couldn't find out that many volunteers to go with me for night hikes because they told you not to do it. So I went out just a few hundred feet. <laughs> gotcha. Yep. Really Dave. great show. Thank you. Thank Dave, you. What, Dave, what type of camera did you use? Just a simple uh, um, uh, Canon 35 millimeter and with a, a lens that's a, a, like a 205 zoom or three, 300 zoom. So very simple camera. And again, it'd be good to have a, a extra camera because in the rainforest, you will sometimes get it wet. So it's sometimes good to have an extra. Um, here we go. Um, Galapagos was this, the second half of this trip. And um, we flew, again, flew from Quito out to Guayaquil and flew out to the Galapagos and got on a boat. Um, all these pictures are days uh, as well. So this, the, the dates of the trip were the end of January uh, to early February for the, the second half, so for the Galapagos half. Um, there is our boat. Uh, it's a pontoon, it's called the Archipel. It is uh, flown under the Ecuadorian flag. Um, and the, it, the capacity was uh, 16 uh, people and we had 14 uh, people on our particular uh our particular cruise uh javier was our uh was our naturalist and he was a native galapagoan i, I guess um so he was he was a a good guy and a lot of stuff we went um there's Thina waving to us so uh we went um by zodiac to uh, from the boat to the islands uh, every day when we were doing our um, excursions off the boat. That's the inside of the boat with the, the cabins on the, so the sleeping quarters on the, on the side. And there's Sandy in the middle with his um, uh, camera, laptop camera going on or, or iPad camera going on. Um, so, and then this was the dining facility here and then back, um, in the back towards the bright windows is uh, just a sitting area. And then off the back was where we kind of boarded the, the Zodiacs. So um, really nice small ship excursion. Uh, was the name of the outfit was Overseas Adventure Travel. Um, this isn't a commercial for them, but I thought they did a nice job. Really, really like the small, the small ship aspect of it. There is our uh, itinerary, overall itinerary on the left and on the right. Every day the naturalist wrote out a detailed itinerary for what time they needed to be where. Um, and you can see on there wet landing and dry landing. That was, uh, that meant you were landing in the water. So don't wear your hiking boots or you were, it was a dry landing. You could go ahead and wear your hiking boots. This was our path. Um, this was uh, dictated by the uh, government of um, the Galapagos. So the Galapagos is a separate province of Ecuador. So it's like another state. It kind of has its own state level government or whatever. And all the land, all the islands there are part of the uh, Galapagos National Park. And the uh, water is Galapagos uh, National, let's see if I get the name here, National uh, Marine Reserve. So they are um, all under, all that area is under federal protection. The map that you see, or our path, our route was on the eastern side of the Galapagos. On the left-hand part of the screen, this island over here is the big one that we didn't ever get to. That's uh, not traveled to very often uh, by, uh, by people. So our first, or the first place that we went after we kind of got going and landed, first day we checked out our ability to snorkel, and then the second day we went to Genovese Island, and we climbed up some steps, rickety steps up to the top, and up there was um, a nesting colony of Nazca boobies. So this, these are Nazca boobies. 
uh, and there were a couple, a few of red boobies uh, in there as well. Uh, did not see any uh, blue-footed boobies. So Nazca boobies and red-footed boobies in this particular column. This is the Nazca booby. The Nazca booby um, is a recent split off from what's called the masked booby. The masked booby sort of in the Galapagos and kind of off the coast of the northern part of South America was split off into the Nazca booby uh, a little while ago. So the Nazca booby has an orange, not yellow bill. Um, the masked has a yellow bill. So that's one of the things that separates them. Uh, interestingly, so although the booby regularly lays two eggs, it never raises two young. The first egg is laid four to nine days prior to the second egg. The older chick always, if it's still alive, ejects the second one, and the second one is consumed. Consumed by, well, sometimes, sometimes that nest of boobies, but sometimes uh, crabs or land birds or frigate birds uh, looking, looking around there. So there's the Nazca. Another look at the Nazca booby with a um, ground nest with two eggs in it. So the first one hasn't hatched yet. And that's what they look like once they uh, grow up to be a cute fuzzy furball. So that's the Nazca, that's the Nazca booby. We happen to see way more Nazca boobies than we saw the other two. Kind of come to that later on. This is, uh, it's called the uh, um, Galapagos dove. And it is, uh, uh, well, not always on the ground, but mostly on the ground. Um, it's real pretty, that blue eye is very, uh, very striking in the pink legs. Uh, it's the threat to this guy is feral cats. So where there are people, and a number of the islands have, have people, there are 18 main islands, and they are all volcanic in nature. So they are not particularly lush with vegetation. In fact, they are very sparse uh, in vegetation. So what you have in the Galapagos is a lot of endemics, that are unique to the Galapagos, not found anywhere else. But you do not really have five diversity. So this is the exact opposite of what we experienced, what Dave just talked about, the huge amount of biodiversity uh, on the mainland in the, in the uh, country of Ecuador, with the, especially with the, uh, with the rainforest there. So um, this guy lives in, makes his nest in, uh, on the ground or in old mockingbird uh, nests up in cacti sometimes. Here's a mockingbird. So the Galapagos mockingbird. So there are, there are four different species of mockingbird based on geography. So they're geographically and hence physically isolated. So they've grown to be their own separate species. They've diverged genetically enough that they are their own species. Uh, so this particular guy, we were on Genovese Island when we saw this one, so that meant it was a Galapagos mockingbird. And you'll see that the other ones don't really look a whole lot different. Um, okay, and then this is, uh, we were on Floriana, and this is the Floriana mockingbird, a different species. You can see that they really look a lot alike. Um, this was our uh, naturalist, uh, Javier. And Javier is hunkering down to take a picture of this mockingbird. And you can see that he is, um, he's, I don't think he's a whole foot away from this thing. And it's just curious. It's not scared at all. That was an interesting phenomenon in the Galapagos. And I guess it's anywhere where um, wildlife hasn't experienced predation. So if it's experienced predation, then it's scared and it runs away. These haven't. This is all a natural reserve. So they're very curious, and we were able to get very close. You saw how close those pictures were of the uh, Nazca booby, of the, of the uh, Galapagos dove, and you'll see as I go through this deck that um, Dave was able to get really, really great, uh, very close pictures uh, of that. So that's the mockingbird. Now we're at the red-footed booby. Uh, the red-footed booby, uh, as you can see, they're beautiful red feet, kind of blue. Um, uh, beak going on there. Um, 
it's interesting. So th this booby and all the boobies, uh, they never carry their prey in their beak. They always swallow it. When they get to the nest, then they regurgitate it um, and, uh, the, and feed the young. So uh, as I said, this comes in a couple of color morphs. This is a very dark, a brownish color morph. Uh, and we were able to see, um, there's another look at the brown uh, color morph. Really, again, look how close you get. And look how, uh, what a great picture. Uh, there's the white uh, color morph of that red-footed booby. See a big old claw on the on the toe of that um, of that webbed foot with that guy. And these color morphs are not segregated um, by geography at all, and they interbreed. And it's it's a common uh, common for them to both to see both color morphs in the same place. This was uh, a fun, fun to watch. What you see um, flying out uh, above the water are Wilson storm petrels and Galapagos petrels. And then on the, on the right hand side, so over, over here, you see a short-eared owl swooping in. And he kind of lands, whoops, let me go back. He kind of lands and takes a, takes a gander and studies it all for a while. So this is a short-eared owl, similar to the one that we have here. Short-eared owls are very um, widespread around the world. So this one probably is not one that would then migrate to here during the um, during uh, our summertime to, to nest here. Uh, and then it, you can see that it has a petrel it, and, it, and it flew away, so it's flying away from us, kind of flew toward us and past our shoulder and away from us uh, above that red-footed booby there. So it, it got one of the petrels, so it's, it's able to have some lunch uh, as well. Um, interesting fact about short-eared owls, that when they're forced to flush, the female, when she's forced to flush from her nest, she will often defecate uh, on the eggs, resulting in a putrid smell. Uh, presumably repelling the predator and or at least masking the, the scent of the nest. All right, this is a, uh, a short, or, or uh, sorry, a red-billed tropic bird. This is a juvenile. It was in a, a little nook or cranny underneath a, a little uh, a rock there. Um, so these guys, uh, and all these, uh, all the young, all the nestlings heading towards being a fledgling, are very dependent upon two people, two, uh, sorry, two parents hunting for them and feeding them. So if something happens to one parent or something happens to both parents, what's going to happen is that this little dude isn't going to be able to make it. And that was what Javier thought was probably happening to this guy. He had seen him there the week before looking exactly the same with no parents around. So he didn't think that this particular guy was going to make it. Even though he had been, you know, he had grown to, you know, being ready to fledge before too awful long, still probably not going to make it. Now the adult red-tailed tropic bird, red-billed uh, tropic bird, uh, have these beautiful long tail streamers. Uh, as long or more uh, uh, as their body length. Um, and these are interesting guys in that they cannot stand and walk proficiently. So they require an unobstructed takeoff from land, but it floats on the ocean water and it can take off with, from there without uh, really any problems. Okay, the Galapagos sea lion. So there are um, 20,000 to 50,000 of these guys uh, that are um, in the Galapagos sort of on a on a year to year basis. They're not widely distributed, but the huge variability in the numbers is dependent upon their food. So like an El Nino or a La Nina year, they're gonna, their numbers are gonna dwindle because they don't have access to enough food. So they're gonna have 
a lot of failure of their uh, of their young. So there's some more um, more sea lions. And some more. So one of the other big things that you do uh, when you're on a Galapagos tour is that you go snorkeling every day. So you go snorkeling at least once every day. Sometimes you go snorkeling a couple of times uh, every day. So this was uh, one of the guys that came and played uh, with, uh, with us. Dave got a couple of shots of him being just, just curious and coming over for a visit. The uh, swallow-tailed gull is almost endemic. It's only found a couple of other islands um, sort of in around the um, Ecuador, uh, kind of Colombia sort of area. Um, while not breeding, this guy is totally pelagic, so only only out of the ocean. He's not, not hang around land. Um, migrates eastward to the coast of Ecuador and Peru and is in that open water. Um, the Galapagos, by the way, I don't I don't think I mentioned, are about 600 miles off, off the coast of Ecuador. So somebody just unmuted. Uh, and the other interesting thing about this guy is it, um, it when it feeds, it's nocturnal. So when it's hanging around us, you know, in, in there and, and nesting or whatever, it's, it's during the day. But it feeds, it's a nocturnal feeder uh, out, uh, pelagically. Uh, these are some interesting behaviors when the uh, two of them would meet. So there's this bowing uh, acknowledgement of each other and then clicking beaks, uh, sort of, you, I know you, you know me. And there's a good picture of, uh, of the swallow tail on the right side over, over here, the right side. Uh, a good picture of the swallow-tailed gull. All right, the frigate bird. So there are two species of frigate bird in the Galapagos. One is the great frigate bird, and the other is the magnificent frigate bird. And they're hard to tell apart. Um, the greater, the great, uh, has a green sheen. So the, on the left, you can see it on the back of that one. It has a green sheen, and on the right, uh, that could be, I can't really tell because I can't see the back, but the magnificent frigate bird. So great frigate birds are seasonally monogamous. Uh, they have a really long breeding season, though. It can be as long as two years. Um, they sit on eggs for 50 days. They're 160 days before the young fledge. So it's a really long time. Um, but these, there are so many of these, and they're so widely distributed that they are... Um, a, a species of least concern. They spend days and nights on the wing. They just fly. They have the ability to shut down their uh, their brain to be able to fly with sort of one eye closed and half their brain closed uh, for for minutes at a time so that they can uh, get get rest. And there are the gullar sacs that are not uh, inflated, just kind of hanging there. Only the male has the red gullar sac. Now the magnificent frigate bird is the other frigate bird, and it is um, purple iridescent on the back uh, when you get a chance to see it. Uh, male again, males and females are really long uh, uh, incubation or really long uh, time to before they fledge. Uh, uh, also, and this is the female on the top and the right, so they look very different. Um, and uh, uh, one of the other interesting things, the, the, a study found that the magnificent bird, magnificent frigate bird on the Galapagos Islands is genetically and morphologically distinct from the other birds. In other words, they have geographically and then hence genetically isolated themselves. And they think that this happened, geneticists can do this uh, study, and they think that this happened several hundred thousand years ago that they became so distinct. Uh, females are bigger than males. I don't know. Okay, there we go. Yellow crowned night heron, that's a guy that we have uh, here as well in North America. And they uh, eat a lot of crabs. They're active both, it's a, called a night heron, but they're active either during the day or during the night. And what drives their activity really is high tide. So they are active uh, three hours before and three hours after the high tide. So that's when they're out hunting. So their, their day or their active period is really determined by the tide rather than the, um, 
the, the daylight. Uh, this is a lava heron, uh, and there are uh, three different species that are, um, you know, in the world of biology, so there are lumpers and there are splitters. So the splitters are currently in vogue uh, with this particular guy and split it apart into the lava heron, what we have here, the little green heron, and the striated heron. So when they're lumped together, as they will probably be someday again and once were, they're called the green-backed heron. Um, it's one of the few birds that uses as a tool to hunt. It'll drop uh, lures into the water like breadcrumbs or leaves or whatever to try to lure a fish to come and bite. Uh, this is a ruddy turnstone, another bird that we have uh, in North America. It is uh, um, a, a migrant, a big time, big time migration. Uh, the Sally Lightfoot crab, very cute, but not very good to eat. So it's fish bait mostly. Um, let me get to a couple of more things here. The Galapagos penguin and a scuba diver being so close, a shock of gray hair. So I have no idea who that is. Could have been any one of us. Um, the Galapagos penguin, there are only about a thousand breeding pairs of Galapagos penguin. Um, and they're endemic uh, just to there. They're very small, so they're subject to a lot of predation. The green, uh, the green sea turtle, uh, distributed worldwide. Uh, they're in trouble because of uh, loss of beach habitat for them to lay their eggs. There's a couple of green turtles making baby green turtles. And there's their tracks going up the, uh, up the beach to lay the eggs. A couple of, uh, of uh, uh, I'm, I'm running a couple of minutes long here, I apologize. A couple of the uh, uh, poster children uh, for the Galapagos is the giant tortoise. So this particular one, guy is called Lonesome George. He was the last of his species. Uh, he died in 2012 uh, in captivity. Uh, they tried to mate him with all the other different species and none of those hybrids uh, were viable. There are uh, 10 species currently of the 15 that Darwin identified when he did his uh, trip in the uh, 1850s. And there are about 19,000 individuals in the wild. Uh, this is D, so we went to two places to see uh, tortoises. One was the, a place where they were propagating them and that was this particular place. And then another was a reserve. So I'll show that guy a picture from that in a moment. So Diego was a very, um, very productive in captivity, and he produced an awful lot of progeny. He was willing to mate in captivity, um, such that, unfortunately, in my opinion, they have way too many young tortoises that are that are his, that have his genes. So there's not enough genetic diversity. A little disappointed when I heard that they were using him, but he was prolific and 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 made a lot of babies. So. And there's one of the ones in the wild uh, at this preserve. And this is how big the tortoise shells are in one of the cafes we stopped at. They was uh, uh, nice enough to climb in one so that we could see. They have a, a Galapagos land iguana, which is uh, and a, a lava lizard. So a couple of the reptiles that we saw. So the other poster child is the Galapagos finch or the Darwin finch. Uh, there's a chart on the left which shows the rows. The rows going down on the left side are the different finch species, and the columns going across the top are the different islands. So as you can see, there are different finch species that are on different islands. For example, the top row and the bottom row, those two species are found on almost every island, whereas the medium tree finch here in the middle, it's only found on one island. And then you have a phylogenetic tree on the right hand side which shows you the different the 15 different species and how they're uh, how they're related to one another this is the one of the big ones with a big beak there's kind of a medium beak and there's a smaller beak but still not as small as the warbler beak uh, which um, which defines the species so this was Darwin how he came to understand and, and come up with the, uh, the theory of uh, natural selection was based on how the finches adapted and genetically evolved to be able to deal with the food that they had. 
Uh, the marine iguana. Uh, so there's there it is with a little bit of salt on its head from uh, from being in the being in the salt water. And there he is swimming. There's and have the the last the last couple of slides here. The blue footed booby. So the blue footed booby is the other other poster child for um, the of the Galapagos Islands. They are very cool looking. They are very interesting. Um, they stay uh, cool in their hot environments um, they, uh, by, by uh, urinating or uh, defecating on their feet. Their feet are very um, highly vascularized and not insulated at all. So they have a lot of uh, exchange, heat exchange going on there. So if they're on the hot rocks, they're getting hot. Um, and the, the blueness of the feet of the booby um, means something. So their, their courtship display is leaning over and raising one foot and showing that foot to the, to the potential mate. And they did a study and they found out that the healthiest chicks tended to have fathers with intensely blue feet. So it, that's what it's about. So it shows that the father is able to feed himself well, and there is the blueness of the feet. And there are uh, a couple of um, a couple of uh, eggs still under that booby. So the first one hasn't hatched yet. This is the the numbers of boobies in the Galapagos. So they're as a, as the three species. They are doing fine all around the world. The red-footed booby in the Galapagos was 140,000 breeding pairs. We never saw that many. We did not go to the islands where there were huge red-footed booby nesting colonies. We definitely saw more Nazcas than anything else. Uh, we saw, um, I don't know, hundreds of those. We saw tens of red-footed and probably a few more tens of the blue-footed booby. So there you go, that's it. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, Bill. And thanks to Dave again. Um, I have uh, several questions from folks, so let me pull up this chat box and make it okay. larger. Um, and actually, Dave, Dave, are you there? Yep. Okay, so I think some of these probably for both of you guys. Um, and I'll generalize some of these, I think, because it's it's about a lot of these questions about trip logistics. So, um, you know, how long were you guys, what was the duration of your trip? Um, and uh, company, which company did you use? Um, who did you book through? Um, we, and any advice you'd want to, you know, give to um, any advice, trips, tips, trip, tricks, excuse me, for someone who would, maybe I've had a little too much wine, I don't know, <laughs> who would like to do a trip like this. So we're going to start here. We went with overseas adventure travel. Uh, we usually use the, the oat brand O overseas adventure travel and they pride themselves on small groups of about oh 15 we were on 14. Uh, basically we we really fortunate because we saw a lot of other boats which are leased out to different tour groups and we got the catamaran in bill's presentation you saw the catamaran which was much more stable because i know uh, Karen, my wife, is very um, uh, prone to seasickness. So we, we really lucked out, and I don't know if that was the luck of the draw, or, but that would be something before you go to the Galapagos on a small cruise ship, you ask them, what is the size of the boat, you know, and, and again, you can do some homework with what month is best and, and all, but we sort of looked at it. Don't let me put words in your mouth, Bill, but as a way to get away in the cooler months, too. We went in January, beginning of February. Bill? Uh, yeah, uh, we like the small boat. Uh, this is the few numbers of people on the tour. Uh, both guides that we had, Celso, uh, on land in Ecuador, I thought he was absolutely tremendous. Um, Juli, uh, sorry, Javier uh, and the Galapagos was a, a fish uh scuba uh and he was big on taking video and he made a video for us at the end which was really fantastic um but he uh was not so much a bird guy which disappointed me 
but it was okay. He was a good overall naturalist, uh, was able to answer a lot of questions. Uh, that was my first trip with OAT. That was Dave's second trip with OAT. Mm. Going across the bottom, you can see this Thena Taylor, one of our fellow travelers. That was her, I don't remember, Thena 13th or something, 11th or 13th trip. So mm. she's an OAT fan. Thena? Yeah, it, it was yeah probably like my 12th. 12th trip so okay. yeah so the, the, uh, I feel the same way I like oat and if anybody goes with oat you should put one of these guys down name down so that uh, <laughs> so that you get money yeah, off your we get we get a, we get a nickel back <laughs> you get a nickel for benching us and uh, and you get a nickel we anyway we both get nickels right both a hundred dollars yeah, so hundred dollars a hundred dollars off of your expense and a hundred dollars off our next trip so right and it was nice because we also had an active group uh there was two oat groups there at the particular time and the older they looked like they were older folks like we're young you know but uh, <laughs> uh we were more active and they didn't seem to do quite as many um uh, uh, dive trip or you know snorkeling trips as we did and we were more active with the hiking which was nice because I think they probably grouped us and they filled out some stuff on us so they knew that hey this is a hiking group so they want to be more active. Did you say that did both of you say the duration of your trip? Oh. How long? No we did not. Two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. One week in uh, one week in Ecuador and then one week uh, in the Galapagos so it was probably you know, 14, 15, 16 days, right? Whatever that is. And, and uh, going into this trip, I was really looking forward to the Galapagos. Really, really, that was going to be awesome. And it, and it was. But the Ecuador half with the, going to the rainforest and that extra bird day that we did, so Athena and Sandy and the rest of the crew, they went and did something else that day that we went and birded. Uh, we got a bird guide. Uh, our our oat guide, his buddy, did bird guide. So we got uh, hooked up with Gabriel, and Gabriel took us on that day, and we had a we had a tremendous time. Dave's wife went along, and my wife went along, so we had a really a really nice time uh, that day. Sandy, you there? Yep, here. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry we didn't get to go on that trip with you. It looked like you had some uh, great bird in there. We did. It was very. We fun. didn't get up at three thirty though. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That was That's why I'm glad I didn't go. <laughs> so, did you uh, have you been on more oat trips, Sandy and Dee? Yes, been on I think we've been on um, six, six, or, six seven. or seven of them. Oh, okay. And they're they're as you said that one of the nice things about them is that they're small groups. Um, they tend to have very very knowledgeable and good guides. So we we've enjoyed all of them. Good. Yeah. Okay. And then Katie, anything else? I do. Yeah. Um, Mary wants to know how cold the water was for snorkeling and scuba. Was that you, Bill? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Ask it again, Katie. Um, how cold was the water when you were s snorkeling and scuba it, it, diving? It was fine. I, I wore a, a, a t-shirt. I think Dave had a t-shirt. Sandy had a t-shirt. Yeah. I, as I recall, looking back at everybody, like a long sleeve t-shirt. The sun is pretty tough there and you're physically, your back is up facing the sun and you're not, I don't ever do that. So I was, was that was sun protection more than it was really for the right. temperature. Yeah, they had wetsuits available if you wanted to, you know, that was that was an it's extra charge, but the, the water was, was really nice. So it, we didn't need them again. And it varies a little bit, but we're near the, you know, the equator, so it's, going to be warm most of the year. Yeah, the equator runs right through the Galapagos, right through the middle of the Galapagos Islands, and obviously right through Ecuador. So there, you're, we were there in January, February, but when you're on the equator, you know, you sort of don't have a summer, winter kind of a thing. Going on. Yeah, the wetsuits were extra, but the, the goggles and the fins were part of the package. So they helped you with all that stuff. Yeah. Yep. Katie? Um, I don't, I don't think I missed anyone's questions. I don't have any more. My daughter joined us. I don't know if you saw that or not. I wanted to see some of those pictures. She wanted to know what a frigate bird ate, but. <laughs> uh, they, they, 
they eat um, uh, things that they get out of the ocean. So like fish and uh, jellyfish and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mitch, did you have a question? Uh, just one, um, which is probably for either or, um, although it came to mind while Dave was talking about the rainforest in Ecuador. Um, did you see uh, or hear about uh, any Missouri birds that overwinter uh, in any of the areas where you were? I mean, whether or not you actually saw them, was, was that a discussion? Did that get asked? I'm just curious. Yes, we did. And we, I get, we got pictures of the summer tanager and, and uh, some of the thrushes and, and of course some of the, the tanagers also. But yeah, the, it's a common theme. The neotropical migrants were trying to protect the habitats both in the northern and southern hemispheres. So it was very, very much. And we were fortunate and our oat guides were very knowledgeable on some of the conservation and environmental issues. Yeah, the and, yellow warbler was another one that, that, that we saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was we'll, interested in that as a concept. Like, it, it's, um, so we think of those birds as ours when they come here and nest. And when you stop and think about how long are they here when they come and nest? Well, they get here late April or May, so they're here May, June, July. They start heading out in August and September. So when you start counting, they're here like four or five months and they're somewhere else. We say they're ours and they're somewhere else like mo most of the year. Well, guess what? They're their birds and they come up here to expand and take advantage of the you know, space that we have to be able to uh, raise the young. It was kind of an eye-opening moment when I figured that, figured that part out. What, what was interesting, I'll add one other note here. The, the trip, the way it was set up was, was fabulous because in the Amazon, there was all this great biodiversity, but you never got really close to it because it was so elusive. And we were always trying to cover, you know, a lot of ground and maybe catch a glimpse of this and that, except for some of the things like the calyx, but, you know, which would congregate things, but, uh, you know, stark difference between that and the Galapagos where you had fewer species and Bill and I have had a discussion over a glass of wine or two or three along with Sandy and Tina and Dee Dee, but uh, you know, it, it's a smaller diversity, but the exposure and, and getting, you know, facial shots of these different animals is just fabulous. And uh, it, it, it was just a great, you know, with the, with the two contrasts there. So I got a question. Um, it sounds like they're, it's pretty much similar year round in the Galapagos um, as far as temperature and mm -hmm. climatic conditions. What about in the mainland of Ecuador? Are there, are there distinct uh, rainier and drier seasons? Uh, you're still on the equator, but uh, how, how does the uh, climate change there when you're over in the, in the forest side? I think there is some variation, you know, with some months having more more rain than others, both on the mainland uh, and again on the ocean with the Galapagos, there are some times of the year that are more prone to higher winds and storms. So okay. that's something you probably want to check out too, because we were aiming for calmer, calmer seas. And talking about the quality of the guides, again, you know, with like I said, 4,500 different species of butterflies. Nobody could answer the butterflies, and but uh, 152 species of, of hummingbirds in Ecuador. So I mean, it's the diversity is just tremendous. It is a mega diversity hotspot in you know the, the country. It's just fabulous, and the fish. The fish were great too. I'm sure if you in there, Karen Meyer, if you enjoyed the fish as well with this the the snorkeling. Okay, any other comments or questions? It sounds great. Thank you both, you guys. Yeah, it was really very interesting. Thanks very much, Dave and Bill. It's great stuff. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to package that together for the group this evening.